Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. Will you stand with me? Let's go before the Lord. I was looking at the bulletin from last week. And it says living in faith every day. L-I-F-E is an acronym. Life for living in faith every day. 2012. And so let's go before the Lord tonight and let's ask him to help us do that. Amen. Amen. So Father, we thank you that we can come into your presence tonight. What an honor and a privilege. Lord, thank you that you are waiting for us. And Holy Spirit, you are the revelator and the teacher. And Jesus, you told us that the Holy Spirit would Give us those things that belong to you so that we could grow and be your church in the earth, the extension of your kingdom, bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. So here we are tonight, hungry and thirsty, and we ask that you would open our hearts as we open your word. As we open our ears, almighty God, teach us, change us, rearrange us. This is your year, Father. It belongs to you. And you've given it to us. So we're asking that you own us this year. Amen. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen? We'll give somebody a high five on the way down. Living in faith every day is the title of this message because Jim's coming on this weekend and he's going to share with us vision and cast vision for the coming 2012. And so before this gets taken down and before things change, and this will be up for a couple weeks until our graphics department has time to do what we need them to do, I wanted to teach on exactly what this sign says, L-I-F-E. And it's taken out of John chapter 10, verse 10, when Jesus is talking about the dividing line and the line that he drew in the sand between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. He's talking about being the good shepherd. And he says that the thief comes, speaking of Satan, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And if you want to know what the mission statement of God for you is, it's found right there in John 10.10. 10. Satan wants to kill. He wants to steal from us, kill us, and then destroy us eternally in the second death. That's his modus that's his M.O. That's how he's moving. He moves through deception and fear. He knows how to arouse the lust of the flesh. He knows how to speak into our lives. He knows how to cast imagination. Some of you right now are going to be drifting in your minds. And he's going to just do everything he can to distract you tonight because God forbid you should get the word of God and have your lives changed. But you see, Jesus said, I've come to give you life. Life. And he wants us to live this life. There was a scene in a, a great movie that was, gosh, it's old now. Gosh, at least 206 is when it came out. I think I'm not sure when My Big Fat Greek Wedding came out. Do you remember that movie? Any of you see My Big Fat Greek Wedding? It, it just took our country by storm. And it was about a Greek girl who was from a Greek family. And she was marrying somebody that was not Greek. And her dad was really upset, really upset that she would dare to go outside the family, outside the culture, outside the language. And she, there's a scene in the movie, and she's sitting on her bed, and she's crying, and she's depressed, and she doesn't know what to do because she's in love. And her mom comes in, and she has a talk with her, and she says, Tula, now you're going to get my Greek invitation. <laughs> Tula, your father and I, we came from Greece. Ah, the war, it brought so much destruction, so much death. There was no freedom. And yet we were supposed to live. How can anyone live like that? So your father and I, we moved and we came to this country. We came here to love and we sacrificed. And we came here so that you and Nikki so that you could live. So, Tula, live your life. Pretty good, huh? The point is, we did all of that 
so that you could be born in a nation where you could actually have dreams come true. So will you please live the dream to love? And you know, God is saying the same thing to his people. I came that you might have life. I came that you could live the dreams that I want to dream through your life, bringing the kingdom of God through you to this generation. I've come so that you could have life, the God kind of life, life that I give you, the life that exists by itself, the God breathes supernatural life of the creator of heaven and earth. And he said, I've come to give you this life and to give it to you abundantly, yeah. overflowing, running over. But you're going to have to live it. You're going to have to believe it, and you're going to have to step into it. Take your chances, make your choices, and live our lives in Christ. So tonight, I want to look at this acronym, and I want to look at living in faith every day. And I want to give you three things tonight about how to do that and what it looks like. Because it's one thing to tell you what to do, but it's another thing when God tells us how to do it. So this is going to be practical. You've never heard, if you're visiting here, I, I don't want you to panic about hearing a woman. God spoke through a jackass to a wayward prophet called Balaam. And God can speak through a jackass. He can speak through a woman. Amen. Somebody say, oh my. <laughs> so how do we do that? What does it look like? to live in faith every day. In 2012, what is that going to, how is that going to, to, to come out in my life? What is my life supposed to look like if I'm really going to live in faith every day? Well, I'm glad you asked because number one, we're going to have to live our lives with eternity in view. I'm going to have to live my life with eternity in view. In other words, what I'm living for is not this world, is not my career, who I'm going to marry, how I'm going to raise my kids. The choices that I'm going to make are not determined by what happens in this life. The choices I make need to be determined by what's going to happen in eternity through the choices I make in this life. There's a big difference. I'm no longer I'm no longer myself. God says you've been bought with a price, Deborah Cobray. Therefore, I glorify God in your body and live with eternity in view every day of your life. Just a little bit of, of stats about this. I just did some mathematics. There's 24 hours in a day. There's 1,440 minutes in a day. And there's 86,400 seconds in a day. Now, every day, God gives us a new gift and a clean slate. His mercies are new over us every morning, right? So if I were going to live 85 years, which is a long life, and if there are, well, let's, let me do this. Okay, in a day, there's 24 hours, 1,440 minutes, 86,400 seconds in one day. So in one year, in one year of my life, there's 8,760 hours. There are 525,600 minutes, and there are 31,536,000 seconds in a year. Now, I, I know that just goes shoo, right over your heads. That's all right. If you live 85 years, you ready for this one? You will have lived 744,600 700, hours. You would have lived 44,676,000 minutes, and you would have had a, experienced 2,680,560,000 seconds. Now, just as a little parenthesis, that's not even close to a trillion, and we are now $15 trillion in debt, so go figure. But anyway, <laughs> it's a number beyond anything you can comprehend. We're going to live 2 billion seconds. Every second is a gift from God. And God says, and I want to read this to you, because the first point is I'm going to have to live my life with eternity in view. God says, live it, but live it for me. Don't live it for yourself. Don't live it for your circumstances. Don't live it.
good for your dreams and your visions because my dreams and my visions are far greater than anything you could hope or ask or think. If I would have carved out my life, I would never be living the life I'm living right now. Never would I have dreamed such a life up. Never would I have thought I could do such things that God has allowed me to do, travel the world and do the things that Jim and I have done. Never! I would have thought too small. You see, never let anybody else design your life because they will make it too small. But when you let God design your life, you let God dream his dreams through you, it will be bigger, exceedingly, and abundantly beyond anything you could hope or ask or think. But I'm going to have to live with eternity in view. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. There's a day coming when it's over, and you and I now are off of earth time. The seconds, the minutes, the hours, the years are over. And now we step into eternity. Living with eternity in view. You know, we, we are creatures of time. We don't understand how long eternity is. Someone once used the illustration that if there was a sparrow, and if that sparrow went to the Atlantic Ocean on the east coast of the United States and filled up his beak with the Atlantic Ocean water, flew all the way across the United States to the Pacific Ocean in California, emptied out his beak and waited 1,000 years before he made the next trip, and he emptied the Atlantic Ocean into the Pacific Ocean, and then he emptied the Pacific back into the Atlantic, you would not even scratch one day in eternity. Where's my helper? Now, I'm going to need you to hustle. This is an illustration. This is time right here. This represents my life and your life, this black top of this tape. Now, I want you to take time, and I want you to run out that foyer and run all the way back. Keep going. Keep going. I'm getting a blister. Keep going. Keep going. Run through the door all the way around. Keep going. Keep going. Did I lose my eternity? Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Run over here. Now, if you're watching, if you're streaming this, oh, my. I've got caution tape, and eternity is the caution tape, and my life is represented by one inch of black tape. Now, I've lost my eternity. Where did he go? <laughs> here he comes. Hustle. Come on, young man. Come on. Keep going. Did you lose time? You can do this. If the sparrow can go to the Atlantic Ocean and empty his beak in the Pacific and rest a thousand years, how much more? Keep going. Run. Let me see you. Now you see, now we're not letting you out of here. <laughs> Middle section, you are completely tied in. What's the point? The point is that this is time. And this is eternity. Only it's never ending. It's never ending. This is my life. And this is what's ahead of me. And in 2012, we are so going to get in shape. <laughs> Mike, thank you. Didn't you do great? I'm going to let you take this. So what's the point? Number one, if I'm going to live in faith every day, number one, I'm going to have to live with eternity in view. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, so now we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. For the things we see now will soon be gone. And that verse says at the beginning of that verse, for now we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. So my exhortation to my family here at The Rock and those listening 
is to let's this year in 2012, if we're going to live in faith every day, first thing we're going to have to do is fix our gaze and view life through eternity and not through the everyday time that we live in because this time is going to determine how I am going to spend eternity and what I will be doing because there is a judgment seat and my works will be judged and I'm either heaven bound or I'm on my way to hell. And if I'm heaven bound, then I sure want to have something to throw at the feet of my king, a crown and rewards that I can give back to him. And I'm going to be awfully embarrassed if I took all those billions of seconds, minutes and years, and lived for myself. So number one, living in faith every day is live with eternity in view. Number two, if I'm going to live in faith every day, then I'm going to have to number two, and I'm only going to give you these three points, practice audacious faith. Now, I don't know what it is about the word audacious. I just like to say it. Audacious. Go ahead, say audacious. audacious. It's a good word. Isn't it fun on your mouth and on your tongue? I can almost say it with a southern accent. Audacious. <laughs> audacious. What in the world does audacious mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. It means recklessly bold, rash, adventurous. Intrepidly daring. Oh, I like that one. Intrepid. I've seen ships named intrepid. I had to look it up. Lord, what does intrepid mean? Intrepid means you are resolute. You are determined. You have set your course, and nothing is going to keep you off course. So what does it mean to be audacious? It means to be recklessly bold, rash, adventurous, intrepidly daring. In other words, this is an adventure he's called us to live with him. And it's a divine romance, by the way, because he loves us. So our king has invited us, his bride, to come and live on this adventuresome life, this daring life of faith with him, insolent and shameless. So God says, child, I want you to live in audacious faith. Okay, Lord, so I, I can see that it's audacious, recklessly bold, rash, adventuresome, intrepidly daring, insolent, cheeky, sorry. Oh, that cheeky girl. You know what that means in Australia? It means you're just insolent and impudent and irreverent. Yes, yes, irreverent, not to God, but to the things of Satan where you're not afraid and he doesn't stop you and there's nothing that hell has to put in your life that you're afraid of or that you care about because it means nothing because you've got audacious faith. So what does audacious faith look like? Well, I've described it in words. Now let's look in the word of God. Someone that models audacious faith to us and what happened. Now, I love this woman. I'm going to meet her when I go to heaven. But we, found, we find her in the book of Matthew and in the book of Mark. Now, I'm going to be in the book of Mark, but I'm going to scoot over to Matthew for just a moment. But let me read this to you in the book of Mark, chapter 7, and we're going to read and begin with verse 24. Now, Jesus has just had and gone neck to neck, nose to nose with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And it says in verse 24, chapter 7 of the book of Mark, it says... From there he arose and he went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now that's modern day Lebanon on the coast. And he entered a house and wanted no one to know it. And he entered a house and he wanted no one to know it. And he entered a house and he wanted no one to know it. Now that's important because he didn't want the fame that he walked in to follow him there. He wanted to rest. He wanted to be alone with his disciples. Men, have you ever just sat on the couch with your remote and you do not want to be disturbed? Can I have a witness for the sons in the house? You are now in that waffle that God has given you in your brain that is the no waffle place. You know that place when your wife says, what do you think? And you say nothing. And she says, oh, really, what are you thinking? And you're really thinking nothing. Because men have the ability to do that. And we women are just jealous because we've got spaghetti in our brains and you've got waffles compartments. And it's just not fair. So Jesus doesn't want anybody to know he's there. It says, where are we? He entered a house and he wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman, a woman, a big mouth woman, 
whose daughter had an unclean spirit, heard about him, and she came and she fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek. She was a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first, for it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. She answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. When she went to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. Now, audacious faith is reckless and adventuresome, insolent, cheeky at times. And I'm going to just quickly look at this incident and give you some points about what audacious faith looks like through what she did. First of all, he wanted to be hidden, but he couldn't because of her. She came. She came. And then she wouldn't take no for an answer. She fell at his feet. She understood what he had to say. She accepted it. And she spoke in faith. So audacious faith, looking at her life. If I'm going to live in faith every day, number one, living with eternity in view. Number two, living in audacious faith. I'm going to have to sometimes get through the silence of God because he didn't talk. He didn't talk to her. You ever felt like God does not talk to you? Audacious faith is going to have to travel through the rejection of God because Jesus said, no, it's not right for me to give what belongs to the children and give it to you, a dog. And the rebuke of God. A lot of us would have said, whoa, okay, bye. You're not who I thought you were. I'm out of here. This church isn't loving. <laughs> oh, who does that pastor think he is? Rebuking us like that. Well, sometimes God seems rude. What a thought. No, you didn't like that, did you? I got one holy clap. The rest of you are going, oh, I don't know about this. You know, it's a woman speaking, and so you just never know. So let's look and see some things about audacious faith from this woman. He put her in a test to draw out her faith because he already knew what was going to happen. And she passed every test he put out, and she passed it. And God thought so much of this woman that he put her in the book of Matthew and he put her in the book of Mark so that she could teach Deborah Cobre and her family here at The Rock in 2012, on January 4th, how to live audaciously in faith every day. How about that? We're going to meet up with her. So let's look at some things. She overcame his silence, she overcame his rejection, and she overcame his rebuke with Point one, and this is really going to be confusing because I've got three things to give you and then I've got four points inside of the three points. So I'm not going to say point one, I'm going to go dot. <laughs> this is what happens when you turn 61. You just kind of, you know, it's mush. All right. This woman answered and came when he wanted to be hidden. It says that he could not because she came. I love that. From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. He entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came. She came. She came. If I'm going to live in faith every day, I'm going to have to have shameless persistence. Because she's crying out to him, and the disciples are saying in Matthew, if you go to Matthew chapter 15, and they just said in Matthew 15, they said, listen, Jesus, she's making a racket. She is embarrassing us. Send her away. And Jesus didn't say a word. So she had to travel through the shame. She had to travel through the intimidation. And men, you have no idea how much you can intimidate us. Now, you may not believe that because we can bluff it really good. But you take a woman who is not a Jew and who is a Canaanite, She's outside of her people. She's in with the Jewish community. And now she's in with religious holy men. And there's no women around. And she's screaming her head off, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The disciples are shooing her away. And yet she didn't take no for an answer. Shameless persistence will not take no for an answer. It will keep coming. It doesn't stop. God, I don't care if you seem to be saying no right now because I know your delays are not your denial. Sometimes, God, it doesn't seem like you answer, but you said keep on praying. You said ask and keep on asking. You said seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. And I'll answer and I'll open 
open doors for you and I'll give you your answers. Shameless persistence is part of audacious faith. You will not take no for an answer. Your dreams have died. Well, guess what? 2012, 2012, wake them up again, my darling. Let Jesus kiss you awake and get up and dream again with God. Dream again. So what if you failed in 2011? So what if you lost your house in the, in the recession? So what if you don't have a job right now? That is nothing to God. That is not a chip off of the asphalt of heaven which is such pure gold you can see through it. This is not about things. This is about faith. Amen. Listen, I've said this to you before. Faith puts no limits on God, and God will put no limits on faith. Amen. This woman, audacious faith, shamelessly persists. She doesn't take no for an answer, and she keeps coming. You know, there's an old saying, you can count the seeds in an orange but you cannot count the oranges in a seed. Did you hear what I said? You can count the seeds in an orange, but you can't count the oranges in one orange seed because that seed represents a tree and that tree represents fruit. And you cannot know how much fruit that tree is going to represent. And your seed may be dead and it may have died, but God says it's going to take your death. It's going to take you to understand this isn't about your plan, it's about mine. And if you'll keep coming and shamelessly persist through the silence, the rejection, and the rebuke, I will answer you. What else did she do? She humbled herself. She was completely dependent on Jesus being the only answer that would fix her problem. There was nobody else but Jesus. She didn't have the hospital option. She didn't have the doctor option. She didn't have the grandparent option where she could ship her off. No, her daughter was grievously vexed with the demon. She was a young woman because she had a child. She was a desperate mother that wasn't even a Jew, and she was out of her territory, and she was so out of her comfort zone. But because of the pressing need, her daughter, who she loved, and because Satan had so taken this girl and vexed her and destroyed her life, this young mother said, I don't care. Not only am I going to shamelessly persist, but now I'm going to fall at his feet. I'm going to humble myself, even though he has insulted me. I'm going to humble myself and be completely dependent on him because I know there's nowhere else I can go. Amen. If I'm going to have audacious faith, I'm going to have to humble myself before the mighty hand of God. I'm going to have to depend on him like I've never depended on him before. And, you know, we don't like what's happening right now. Things are being taken away instead of added. But sometimes God works in the trouble. We saw that at Christmas. Trouble is God's stage for miracles. And what looks like you're going to be ruined is nothing more than God's set up for your elevation and your promotion if you will have audacious faith. The next thing she did, let's just read it, Matthew 7, 27. I'm sorry, 7, 25. And she came and she fell at his feet. For this woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast a demon out of her daughter. Number three, sorry, number three dot. <clears throat> she teaches me about audacious faith, to be shamelessly persistent, to be completely humble and dependent on no one but Jesus. I mean, that paycheck, that husband, that job, that house, that relationship, none of it means anything because none of it can fix what's wrong with you, only Jesus. Amen. Only Jesus. The next thing she showed is an honest heart. She could receive correction because this is what happens in Matthew 7, 27. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first, for it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Whoa. Did you just call me a dog? Did you just use a B word on me? <laughs> he didn't, but it could sound like it. And she answered him and she said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. How 
am I in audacious faith? When I get before God, now I have humbled myself. And I am before him. And now he wants to talk to me. He wants to show me where I'm really at. Because what he's doing is he's showing her who she is. You're outside of the covenant of Israel. You don't have any blood covenant from God. I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It isn't your time, woman. You're a Gentile. Your time is coming, but it's not your time now. But you see, faith can speed up the time. Because that's what he's saying to her. That is what he is saying to her. But Jesus said, let the children be filled first. For it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered him and she said, yes, Lord. When God wants to deal with me, when he wants to deal with my heart, my attitudes, my life, when he wants to get up close and personal with me, am I going to be correctable? Am I going to be teachable? Am I going to listen to him talk to me and tell me what needs to change in my life? Because maybe, just maybe, I'm not getting the answers to my faith because there are things in my life he needs to deal with and change before that which I am asking him for can actually happen. Because it would destroy me, I'm not ready for it or I would cause harm and damage. And you see, God's will is always good. It's always to bring growth to us. He's not interested in our comfort. He's interested in making us his. He is not interested in our comfort. He is interested in making us his. It is his year. Let him own us. Let him own us. Teachable and correctable. And sometimes God will do his correcting through people and the ones that you don't respect or like. Mm. What did Pastor, I'm, I'm sorry, what did Pastor just say? What did she just say? Who does she think she is? And we can come into church with a plethora of attitudes and the very person that needs to speak into your life that God wants to use, that clay jar that God wants to use, you don't like and you're judging like some of you are judging me right now. And yet the words and the things that God wants to say, he will use vessels that we don't necessarily want in our lives or would choose in our lives. Honest hearts. She said, yes, Lord. So she had shameless persistence. She didn't take no for an answer. She had a humble heart. She depended completely and solely on him. Nobody else could fix her daughter. She had an honest heart. She was teachable and correctable. And the last one, she had a bold confession of faith, and she spoke up to his rejection. Oh, you're going to speak up to God? Yeah, because watch what happens. Here it is. Verse 28, and she answered him, and she said, yes, Lord, correctable. Yet, she's not done. I love this little woman. This is God she is talking to. God says, come boldly to the throne of grace. Come boldly, child. Get up here. Show me some tenacity, child. Where is your intrepid, daring child? Come boldly to the throne of grace. Come in faith, child. Come and ask me. Come and speak up because she said, yes, Lord, I see what you're saying. I agree. I know I'm not in the house of Israel. I know I have no right to the covenant. I know that I shouldn't have healing, which is bread for the children. But then she says, yes, Lord, but yet even the little dogs eat crumbs from under the master's table. And he stood back and he said in verse 29 and verse 30, and if I could just have it up there, for this saying, for this saying, for this saying, what came out of your mouth? You see, you, you went through my silence. You went through my rejection. You went through my rebuke. And now for this saying, because you passed the test with shameless persistence, you passed the test with humility, you passed the faith test with a correctable and a teachable and an honest heart. Now, because up out of your mouth, your mouth and your heart are agreeing. It's not hypocrisy. You said, oh, Lord, everything you said is true. But, Lord, I'm not asking for the loaf. I'm only asking for a crumb because one crumb is enough to heal my daughter. <laughs> one crumb. I'm not asking for the loaf. I don't need the loaf. I just need a crumb from you, and it's more than enough. And he said, woman, for this saying, go your way. 
for your daughter is healed. Verse 30 said she went home and that child that she loved with a mother's heart was healed and completely whole because she had audacious faith. Living in audacious faith, she was shamelessly persistent. She was humble to the point of, if Jesus doesn't do this, it ain't going to get done. And I can't go anywhere else. I can't look at the boss, my husband, the job, my wife, my children, my friends. I can't look at any human being because they have no ability. It's at the feet of Jesus. Humility and dependence on him and him alone. Oh, and then she had an honest heart. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Everything you say about me is true. Yet, bold, fearless confession before God. But Lord, I don't need a loaf. I just need a crumb. I just need a crumb. And he said, for this saying, go your way. What is God saying? He's saying, if you're going to live in faith every day this year, see your dreams resurrected. Number one, you're going to have to live with eternity in view all the time. You're going to have to live an audacious faith, which is shamelessly persistent, dependent beyond anything else on the planet. That's humility. An honest and a good heart that will take the rebuke, will be corrected, will be changed. And a fearless confession that comes boldly to the throne of God and speaks that which you believe. Now, number three, and we're ending. I said three things. Of course, in the parentheses, there's four things in the three things. But anyway, we're not going there. <laughs> Number three, I'm going to have to do it every day. Living in faith every day. Every day. Not some days. Not when I feel like it. Not when circumstances are right. Not when I'm in love with my husband or he's still in love with me. Not when those divorce papers come. Not when I have to go to court. Not when I want to put the kids in the deep freeze because they are now teenagers and what happened to my children? Who took them and where did they go? Not when I get that pink slip. Not when I get a foreclosure. But every day. Every day. Matthew 6. Verse 11 says in the Lord's Prayer, we ask God, and he told us to ask him, give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread. God knows that we have to live day to day. He doesn't ask me to borrow tomorrow's trouble. He doesn't ask me to look back at yesterday because it's like spilt milk. I can't go relive it. It's gone. I've got today. Today. And God says, as you ask me for your daily bread, Will you give me your daily audacious faith? Every day as you receive from me, can you give back audacious faith every day? And so reviewing and looking at this, living in faith every day for 2012, because God has a plan. He never said it would be easy like Pastor Dan preached last weekend. He said, get busy with God. Who said it was going to be easy? Don't be so hard on yourselves. Great points. I don't know what 2012 is going to bring, but I know who's going to bring it. I know who's going to bring me life. I know who's going to bring me hope. I know who's going to bring me his word. I know who's going to bring me his promises. I know who's going to never leave me or forsake me. I know who loves me. I know that I am known in heaven and that I may not be known in the earth. And the older I get, the less valuable I am. But I know that he'll never cast me aside or throw me away. Because I know the one that knows me every day, every day. So if that's you tonight, if you'd like to live in faith every day with me, would you stand and let's make this prayer our confession. And I ask them to put it up in the overhead. And I'm just going to close this, close this uh, message. Live with the life with eternity in view. Practice audacious faith and do it every day. I'd like us to pray this together. And Lord, we come as a congregation for 2012. And Lord, that little Syrophoenician woman, what, a, what an amazing lesson it is to all of us. Thank you for healing her daughter. Thank you for using her to speak to us 
And Lord, we just pray this prayer. May it be our confession, our heartfelt prayer to you as we say it together. Dear Lord, as we trust you for our daily bread this year, may you receive from us daily our audacious faith, shameless in its persistence, humble in its revelation that you and you alone are the only source of life, and bold in its confession of belief. What we know to be true, your word is forever settled in heaven and will do what it says it will do. Amen and so be it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Living in faith every day for 2012. So be it, Lord. Let's put the amen to it in Jesus' name. Audacious faith. Don't you love that word? Wonderful. The Bible College is incredible. I really recommend if you haven't signed up to sign up. It will change your life. Because in 2012, God wants us to devour his word and have an appetite for righteousness, which is found in his word. So if you have it, it's not, it's affordable. We'll work with you, and I just can't encourage you enough to just partake of what this wonderful, amazing church is offering. And it's an incredible Bible college with wonderful teachers. So that's right outside in the foyer. So sign up. It's not too late. You've been really good. You've been a, just a great, great team tonight. What a family. I love this family. It's always a privilege to come and share the word of God. But I just need to do one more thing tonight before I send you home. It's 10 after 8. Wow, we did really good. But I need to ask you a question. My first point was live with eternity in view. And I showed you that that caution tape and you had time about this big and then everything else is eternity. You know, none of us really plan to die. We don't like to think about it. It's that elephant in the room that nobody talks about. And yet God says it's appointed once for man to die and then judgment, judgment. And so the question I need to ask you is if you were to walk out those doors tonight and boom, it's your last night, drunk driver, Flat tire, crazy truck, who knows? It could be anything. Your heart stops. But if for some reason tonight were your last night on earth, here's the question. Would you open your eyes in heaven? And what makes you think that God would let you into his heaven? Or would you open your eyes in hell? Now, there's probably no one in here that's going, whoo, party on, I'm going to hell. At least if you're thinking that, I'm going to slap you because that's stupid. But you might be saying in your heart, ah, oh, I hope I go to heaven. I think I'm going to heaven. I mean, I'm a Christian. I'm in America. I know Jesus. I'm a good person. But you see, nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you can think your way into heaven. There's nowhere it says you can hope your way into heaven. And there's certainly nowhere in here that says all roads lead to heaven and that good people go to heaven. God says there's none good but him. And he said that your goodness and my goodness, although we may look like we're doing okay when we compare ourselves to each other, God says that's not your measuring stick is each other. Your measuring stick is me. And your goodness in comparison to my absolute holiness and perfection is like a filthy rag. You cannot measure up, child, in your own ability, in your own efforts to save yourself. Case in point... You cannot even keep yourself alive. You cannot even hold your breath for five minutes. How fragile our life is. And this nation has taken God out of everything, taken Christ out of Christmas, but just because this nation is becoming an unbelieving nation doesn't mean that you and I have to be unbelievers. Where would you open your eyes? Heaven or hell? I've already told you you can't hope. You can't behave. This is not behavior modification. I stopped sleeping around. I stopped doing drugs. I grew up, Lord, and now I'm behaving myself. You see, it's not your behavior. It's not your attitude. It's not even what you believe because Satan believes that Jesus is the Son of God and he is not going to heaven. Because if I ask an American, do you know Jesus? They will say, oh, yes. But you see, it's not about knowing him in your head. It's about having a relationship with him 
in our heart. It's not about walking an aisle and saying a little magic prayer. God sprinkles fairy dust over us and poof, we're going to heaven. No, this is far more serious. This is about surrendering all of our heart and all of our life to the God of heaven and earth, the God that loved us so much that he came to earth, became a man, died for you and I, and rose again, taking our sins so that we could get to heaven. See, the only way to heaven, the only way, is God said you must be born again. You must be born again. And Jesus explained it to Nicodemus, who was a great teacher of the law. He would have been a celebrity rabbi today on television. We would have had all kinds of his resource. He would have been famous. And Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, not even during the day. And he says, how do I get to heaven? The question I asked you, he asked Jesus. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said, Lord, I'm an old man. I can't enter until my mother's womb. And he said, Nicodemus, you're a teacher of the law and you don't understand what is flesh is flesh, what is spirit is spirit. Nicodemus, let me explain. You can see the wind. You can see where it goes, but Nicodemus, you can't see it. Even so are those born of the Spirit of God. You live in a fleshly body, but your spirit is eternal, and that's what has been severed from God and has to be born again. And he said, Nicodemus, this is how you get born again. In John chapter 3, you can read it. Nicodemus, I'm going to be lifted up on a cross. As Moses lifted up that snake in the wilderness, even so will the Son of Man be lifted up on that cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Nicodemus, if you look at that cross and if you believe, if you believe I am who I said I am and that I've come for your sins and that I'll be the sacrifice for you and you'll surrender your life to me, letting me be Savior and Lord, Nicodemus, you'll be born again. I'll take you out of the kingdom of darkness, Nicodemus, and I'll bring you back to the Father. I'll redeem you. I'll reconcile you to the Father, and I'll restore all that you're supposed to be. But you must be born again, surrendering your life to me, all of it, not a piece of it, not a part of it, not when you feel like it, all of it. And if you've never surrendered all of your heart, if you've never surrendered all of your life to Jesus Christ, tonight God brought you here so that you could meet him. And in 2012, this would be the beginning of a brand new life for you. So what does that mean to surrender? Well, it means you don't give him a peace, you give him everything. But you don't know, I'm afraid, what if I fail? Well, of course you're going to fall and fail. You can't do this on your own. But God says, I'll come and give you my Holy Spirit. And he'll give you the strength and the power to walk the walk that I need you to walk. You'll make mistakes, but that's okay because that's where forgiveness comes in. But still, it's a surrender of your heart and your life. So if you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life, I'm talking to you. If you've been lukewarm, half in and half out, come to church sometimes, but as soon as something happens, you're out of here. I'm talking to you. If you've been a good person, but you've never ever said yes to Jesus Christ, I'm talking to you. And if you've backslid, if you served God at one time and you're just coming back and you know it's true, but you feel ashamed and you know you need to get right with God, I'm talking to you. God's not in therapy over your sin. He's not in shock over what you've done. He just simply loves us and is asking us to come home and let him fix us, mend us, restore us, make us who we're supposed to be. So all over this auditorium, you've been running from him instead of to him, I'm talking to you. I'm going to count to three. And I'm just going to clap my hands, boom. My husband, when he claps his hands, man, you can hear it through the whole sanctuary. I'm just this wimpy little boom. But all it means is just raise your hands. We're going to do it all together. You say, well, I'm going to be embarrassed. Well, duh. Why would you let one moment of uncomfortable embarrassment stop you from eternity? I tell you, if you were in hell right now, you'd raise everything you could to get out of hell, including your underwear. So if you've been running from him instead of to him, never surrendered all of your heart, backslidden, I'm talking to all of you. Are you ready? One, two, three, let's see. 
See that hand? Let me see. Oh, careful, careful. Count you. Let me see your hands. Hold them high. I see that hand. Wave them at me. I see that hand. I see that hand. I got you. I got you. I got you. Yeah. He's getting you. He's got you. He loves you. There's hands going up everywhere. I don't have my long sea glasses, so you're all a little blurry to me, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to stand up, and as we sing this song, I'm going to ask you to grab what you brought to church with you and slip out of the aisles and come meet me right here at this altar. Let's get right with God. If you raise your hand, come quickly. If you didn't raise your hand, it's just not too late. Just come with everybody else. Let's just get right with God today. It's your night. It's your night. God brought you here to change your life. But you got to give him all of your heart. He's a gentleman. He's not going to take it. You have to give it. Come quickly. It's not too late. Shut up, oh, too bad. Just come on anyway. Quickly. They're still coming. They're still coming. How much he loves us. You know what? I'm just going to ask you to sing it one more time because I know by the Spirit that some of you wanted to come and we stopped. We're going to sing this one more time. We've got time. It's only 20 after 8. We have time for you, and God is asking you, He's knocking on the door of your heart. You will never go wrong chasing Jesus. You're looking at a woman right now that's a nana, respectable, well, somewhat. You would never know what my past was, that I was a throwaway woman, a druggie, a dealer, married to a dealer. You would never know the things that I committed and the things I did in my life. You see, it's only Jesus that can change you. It's only Jesus that can wash you and cleanse you and make you whole. It's only Jesus. He's not in shock over your life. He's just inviting you to come home and get healed. So we're going to sing it one more time. And if that's you tonight, you just run. Just get out of the aisles and get down here. We're going to give you a chance. Come on. Come on. Come home. Come home. Lord, I give you my heart. Children, come home. Give you my soul. Well done. Well done. You had angels assigned to you when you were born. Probably way before then, but we won't go there. And you know what? It says in the Bible that when one sinner repents, and we're all sinners saved by grace, that their angels rejoice and have a party. <laughs> they are having a party in heaven. Going, it's about time. To keep you alive. They love you. And it doesn't matter what you've done. Now it matters what you're going to do. And this is Pastor Dave, in that cute little hat. He's amazing. He is our new believers pastor. And we want to do three things tonight. We want to pray with you because you don't just walk an aisle. Now we're going to pray from our hearts. Then we're going to give you a book that my husband wrote. It's real simple. You can read it in just an hour about five things that God wants you to know about what's just happened to you. And then we're going to offer you something called an SPT, a spiritual personal trainer. And if you go to a gym to work out, you get a personal trainer. Well, when you get saved, you're brand new babies. You don't know what to do. And I didn't leave my children at the hospital. I brought them home and fed them and took care of them. And we want to be a church that takes care of you and helps you understand what's going on and so your SPT you don't have to have them but we give away friends here women get women men get men families get families and they'll they'll just meet you before church for five weeks once a week you can call them during the week if you've got questions or you blew it I remember when I first got saved oh I was such a mess and I messed up all the time I was messing up all the time and I thought oh my gosh I'm not saved I'm not saved God's throwing me out of heaven and I would call 
And I had a friend and she'd say, oh no, God loves you. You screwed up, yeah, but that's what the blood's for. Just let's pray, let's confess it. And each time it got easier and easier and easier not to mess up like that. So God loves you. And we are here to be a family and help you get strong. You're not joining a church. You're saying yes to Jesus. So this is Pastor Dave. So if you just make a turn this way, follow him. We're going to go pray with you, Nate.